Brothers Special Report, NBC News presents Smoking and Health. The background and detailing of the report issued today by the United States Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Smoking and Health. Brought to you by Alka-Seltzer for effective speedy relief of headache and upset stomach. And by One A Day brand Multiple Vitamins, the label with a big red one. Now here's NBC News correspondent Frank McGee. This book containing 387 carefully worded pages is a federal government report. Its title, Smoking and Health, a report of the Advisory Committee to the Surgeon General of the Public Health Service. It was released at noon today and it says, in view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is the judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. That is the basic conclusion. The report says a great deal more and it leaves a lot unsaid. But its key points are these. Item, cigarette smoking is causally related to lung cancer in men. In comparison to non-smokers, Average male smokers of cigarettes have approximately a nine to ten-fold risk of developing lung cancer and heavy smokers at least a twenty-fold risk. Item. Cigarette smoking is the most important of the causes of bronchitis in the United States today and increases the risk of dying from chronic bronchitis and emphysema. Item. It is established that male cigarette smokers have a higher death rate from coronary artery diseases than non-smoking males. Item. High mortality of cigarette smokers is associated with many other cardiovascular diseases, including miscellaneous circulatory diseases, other heart diseases, hypertensive heart disease, and general arteriosclerosis. Item. Pipe smoking appears to be causally related to lip cancer. Item. Cigarette smoking is a significant factor in the causation of cancer of the larynx. Now, the things left unsaid. The report does not say what it is in the tobacco smoke that causes lung cancer. It does not say that there is a proven causal link between smoking and heart disease. In other words, the conclusions regarding heart disease are reached by statistical evidence. Nevertheless, the report is an indictment of cigarette smoking and will doubtless have an effect on the tobacco industry and on those persons who now smoke. The report was handed to reporters at the State Department Auditorium where President Kennedy used to hold his television news conferences at 9.30 this morning. They were locked in there to study the report. At 11 o'clock, a news conference was started with U.S. Surgeon General Luther L. Terry giving the opening statement. Out of its long and exhaustive deliberations, the committee has reached the overall judgment that cigarette smoking is a health hazard of sufficient importance to the United States to warrant remedial action. This overall judgment was supported by many converging lines of evidence as well as by data indicating that cigarette smoking is related to higher death rates in a number of disease categories. More specifically, the committee states on page 61 of the report, and I quote, in view of the continuing and mounting evidence from many sources, it is a judgment of the committee that cigarette smoking contributes substantially to mortality from certain specific diseases and to the overall death rate. Cigar and pipe smoking were found to have little significance in comparison with cigarettes. You will have noted that the committee's report does not cover what appropriate remedial action might be. <coughs> It was not a part of the responsibility of this committee to make such recommendations. I can assure the committee that we will move promptly to determine what remedial health measures the Public Health Service should take. Secretary Celebrezzi has asked me to analyze the report and to make recommendations to him. The staff of the Public Health Service is only now receiving the report and I shall, of course, want their views before making our recommendation. I am sure that other departments and agencies of the federal government, along with non-federal agencies, will also take the report under consideration promptly. You have had an opportunity, I, though I realize it has been brief, to review the document, and we would like at this time 
to receive uh, questions from the press with regards to the committee's report. Dr. Terry, how are the 200,000 physicians who will receive copies of this report likely in their minds to inter interpret appropriate remedial action when they're talking to their patients? You would, how would you answer that as a physician yourself, sir? Well, I, I think in this respect, and this is one reason that we are making an individual distribution to the physician, I think that each physician must make an individual judgment on it. Of course, he should utilize this report and any other information which he has available to him. But I think in order for the report to be most effective in whatever direction it is effective, it will depend upon the judgment not only of the medical profession throughout the country, but of many other involved agencies. One of the ten doctors on the panel was asked just how serious a threat to health is smoking. Answering was Dr. Walter Burdett, Department of Surgery, University of Utah. I think you, you could define this in terms of numbers. Uh, in the case of a carcinoma of the lung, where the mortality ratios are the high, there are about 41,000 deaths. And the committee, uh, in this instance, feels that the major causal factor is smoking. Uh, in uh, other areas, uh, the relationship is not so clear cut. Uh, does this answer your question? You hear the direct causal relationship is now established. This is what uh, many men weren't satisfied with before. Yes, uh, we have, uh, I think I'm speaking for the remainder of the committee, we have thought that uh, uh, in the case of uh, cancer of the lung, and uh, there are other types of cancers mentioned here, also in bronchitis and emphysema, I believe, that there is a direct cause, causal relationship. This, is, this conclusion is based on converging evidence of several different types. Dr. Burdett then commented on the fact that statistical evidence linking smoking and heart disease is strong, but not causal. It's important he tried to make it clear. This would be true, for example, when one is speaking of deaths from coronary disease, although the, there's a 70% increase in smokers when compared to non-smokers, the committee felt that uh, there was uh, not converging evidence uh, to warrant uh, a conclusion that the relationship was causal. Uh, even though in this instance, the numbers of deaths, of course, involved is much, much larger than for carcinoma of the lung. The questioning turned to the value of filters on cigarettes and to air pollution as a possible cause of lung cancer. Answering was Dr. James M. Hundley, Assistant Surgeon General. There is no evidence which will establish the fact that filters have had any effect in reducing the health hazards of cigarette smoke. In the very beginning, you list uh, uh, the sources uh, who have helped uh, uh, furnish evidence in this report. Uh, can you tell us uh, what help uh, you have gotten from the tobacco companies? Several, uh, I think, are listed here in the Tobacco Institute. We, we invited all of the major tobacco companies to submit any evidence that they, the scientific data that they cared to submit to the committee. Every one of the major tobacco companies did make a submission of some sort. This varied from a at one extreme from a few reprints from the scientific literature to, on the other extreme, some very extensive, still unpublished uh, information. Dr. Hundley, would you ask the you know, appropriate expert on your committee about the effects of air pollution on lung cancer? Some of us discussed this a little earlier, uh, slightly. I'd like to go into some detail as to explain what proportion of the lung cancer deaths might possibly be attributable air pollution. Are you lung cancer specifically? Yes. Unless air pollution has effects in other places. Well, I can say in general that the uh, committee held whether it was lung cancer, bronchitis, emphysema, that lung air, air pollution was a very minor factor, far outweighed by the effect of cigarette smoking. The report said that fewer women get lung cancer. The reporters wanted to know the significance of that. Again, answering was Dr. Huntley. We have less evidence in women than we do in men. The incidence is lower also. Why, why is it lower? Six 
expect it on why it's lower? Uh, it's possible, of course, that there are sex differences, per se. Also, of course, it's well known that uh, fewer... Uh, <laughs> uh, in many forms of cancer, there are sex differences between the sexes. Um, also, of course, women smoke less than men, generally speaking. And uh, uh, women smoking is a more recent phenomenon than men. Women took the habit up later, and they tend to smoke less. But there, there may be, as I say, sex differences over and beyond this that account for it. Did uh, the committee find any report which raises a doubt about smoking as a cause of lung cancer? The committee considered all sorts of evidence, opinions, judgments, and I'm sure it's no news to you that there are people in this country who do not think that, or think that cigarette smoking is not a cause of lung cancer. We were fully aware of this and reached the judgment we did despite these other In other opinions. words, this is a very firm uh, conclusion. Indeed, I regard it as a very firm conclusion. Uh, of course, the revelations of the special committee will not end the controversy. One reason for this is that the tobacco industry is economically so important. We will look at that in just a moment, but first, this message. Saluting the men who report the weather on television. With a mass of moist, warm air moving slowly toward this low pressure area. But this morning, there's good news locally. Today and tomorrow, we'll be enjoying clear skies and mild temperatures. Boy, was I ever caught off base with that forecast. What? When you first feel a cold coming on, be sure to take Alka-Seltzer. A combination of ingredients you get only in Alka-Seltzer gives Alka-Seltzer a remarkable ability to relieve many of these cold miseries. Headache, muscular aches and pains, touchy stomach, that feverish feeling. And because you take it as a liquid, Alka-Seltzer acts with speed in getting into and throughout your system. Pleasant, gentle. So at the first sign of a cold, take Alka-Seltzer to help you feel better while you're getting better. It seems certain that if tobacco had little economic value in the nation, there would be almost no reason for the controversy which has surrounded smoking and health for more than a decade. But it does have that value. And to properly understand the controversy, we must understand as well the industry. Since tobacco harvest started in this country, three centuries ago, the world has automated, but the cultivation of the leaf has not. The sweating, back-breaking process of priming or picking the ripe leaf goes on each week during a two-month period. The frantic physical punishment involved in harvesting contrasts sharply with the stage to follow. The patient, tedious curing and yellowing of the leaf. At least 750,000 farm families in 23 states grow tobacco. The financial harvest, well over a billion dollars. Tobacco's Gold Coast is North Carolina. Biggest producer, biggest money maker, North Carolina is also the capital of the frenzied warehouse and auction operations. What you're looking at, what you're hearing is not a commercial. It's the real thing at Grower's Warehouse in Winston-Salem. The bids coming from buyers of each of the major cigarette companies are sometimes as subtle as a wink, sometimes as obvious as a shout. Farmers bring the leaves to auction, tobacco companies take them away and thereby generate a manufacturing process with fantastic national economic impact. This is the complex pre-manufacturing process. Annual salaries for this operation in just North Carolina alone, $25 million. The overall payroll of the tobacco industry, about $400 million for more than 100,000 workers. That does not include businesses and services associated with the industry. Leaf handlers, warehousemen, drivers, suppliers, and retailers. There are about a million and a half retail outlets in the United States.
The furious factory activity of stemming, moisturizing, drying, and packaging has a soporific climax. These hogsheads are not destined for manufacture, not quite yet. They're driven off to warehouses where they will stay two years for additional curing before the cigarette making process begins. In complete contrast to the almost primitive method of harvesting tobacco is the automated method of manufacturing cigarettes. In an almost uncanny atmosphere, a society of machines takes over for the back-aching tobacco picker, the sleepy warehouses. In medicinal cleanliness, the immaculate machines flip out 1,400 cigarettes a minute, and now the figures really become unreal. U.S. production in one day, 200 million cigarettes. One year, more than 528 billion cigarettes. For every American past 15 years old, there is produced 3,986 cigarettes, 9 pounds and 20 ounces, or approximately 20 cartons a year. Only once do human hands touch the cigarette. Within five years, this too will be automated. One hundred and forty-five packs a minute. Just a matter of time and another machine, the cash register, takes over. And again, the statistics are staggering. Annual U.S. sales, 300 billion filter cigarettes, 130 billion, 530 million regular cigarettes, more than 98 billion king size. Overall total, 495 billion, 350 million. They're bought by 61 million smokers in the U.S., the biggest cut of the profit pie goes to the tax collector. The federal government gets more than $2 billion. That's five aircraft carriers and state and local taxes. And the bite goes to more than $3 billion. And the profits are big, too. One company averaging net earnings of $119 million. A fair amount of the money goes into individual company research, apart from joint industry projects. Experimental cigarettes are being made constantly, but that subject is top secret. A good deal of the work is being done in the separation and identification of the chemical compounds in tobacco. More and more sophisticated machinery becomes available. It's expensive, but a cook's tour around the research lab shows quickly that money is no object. Company spokesmen say they are not necessarily conducting medical research. They state two purposes. Improve the present product, develop still a higher quality cigarette. Conceivably, higher quality could mean a safer as well as a more satisfying cigarette than the competitors. For the tobacco industry, what might be called the first crisis of confidence came more than 10 years ago. Dr. Ernest Wender of New York's Sloan Kettering Institute for Cancer Research lit a fuse in 1953. He announced that he had induced skin cancer in laboratory mice by painting them with cigarette tars. Today, Wender and associates continue their lab studies, but basic research has changed. It moves in the direction of identifying and isolating elements in smoke. Sloan Kettering scientists say there could be as many as 1,000 substances in cigarette smoke, and that maybe a dozen of these in pure form might be cancer-inducing. Here is Dr. Wender talking about Sloan Kettering research. Our task as free researchers is to see whether we can identify more and more of the major tumorigenic and ciliate toxic components in tobacco smoke and to see whether we can modify the tobacco product or the manner of combustion in such a way that we can successfully reduce these components by practical means. It is our feeling that these studies will lead to a safer, not necessarily safe, smoke product. In view of the fact that most smokers will continue to smoke in spite of the evidence presented to them. I think that more and more work in this area, which should combine the research efforts of private research institutions together with that of industry, that these studies will lead to a modified tobacco product which will be safer compared to those that have been smoked in the past. One of the first to point an accusing finger toward heavy cigarette smoking was a noted lung surgeon, Dr. Alton Oxner. And that was back in 1936, after discovering a dramatic increase in the number of lung cancer cases among patients. 
Since that time, Dr. Oxner, who's president of his own hospital in New Orleans, has campaigned steadily. In 1954, he published a book, Smoking and Cancer. It's now in its fifth printing, and he's lectured almost continuously. Recently, we talked with Dr. Oxner. We know that a man 50 years of age who's never smoked has eight and a half years longer life expectancy than a man the same age who has smoked a pack of cigarettes a day since he was 21. Now let's suppose that at age 50, I, the smoker, decide to quit and do quit. Uh, are my prospects going to be better or have I already condemned myself? No, your prospects are going to be very much better. It is the one thing that will keep you from developing cancer of the lung. There does come a time, however, Frank, when these precancerous changes are irreversible. But we do know that if one will completely abstain from smoking, that these precancerous changes will revert back to normal, and that the longer the time has elapsed since one has stopped smoking, the less chance he has of developing cancer. So there is no truth to the argument or the belief that, well, I've smoked this long, I probably have the lung cancer, now I may as well go ahead. No, there's no truth in that at all. Although, as I mentioned a moment ago, there are individuals, and there does come a time when this process here is, is irreversible. Unfortunately, we as physicians cannot tell when that time comes. What would you think would be the single most startling piece of evidence that you could present uh, to the American public if you had them all collectively and had all their minds and all their eyes and all their ears at one time to convince them? Of this relationship? Yes, sir. Well, I think the pathologic evidence that we have uh, we here in this, in this institution did uh, originally some of the work to show the changes in the, the lung uh, which occur as a result of smoking. It has been done much more elaborately than we did it by Dr. Auerbach in New York, uh, who exa who's examined a large number of men coming to autopsy. These are veterans, and they have correlated the changes in the lung, the bronchial tubes, with the smoking changes. And these are the most dramatic thing that one could ever see, because in the smoker, they, they, uh, <coughs> these changes that uh, are well, pre-cancer changes up to cancer, whereas a non-smoker, they're perfectly normal. And you can grade this out just according to their smoking history. You can look at the lung and tell how much they smoke right. and how long. That's right. And you can then uh, project from this how much longer they might be able to smoke before they would develop cancer? Yes, fairly well. Mm -hmm. Although we do know that these these precancerous changes, which I mentioned a moment ago, are reversible. And the person who stops smoking completely, and it takes total abstinence, because the individual who has these changes in his lung, these precancerous changes, cutting down does no good, because a few cigarettes a day is enough to keep up the, uh, these changes. Dr. Oxner, why don't all heavy smokers get lung cancer? Well, that's a very good question, Frank. <clears throat> the reason they don't is because uh, uh, the cancer-producing agent in tobacco is relatively weak. It takes 20 or 25 years, and then there's a tremendous variability in our susceptibility to cancer. I've seen a man develop cancer only after smoking 65 years. Conversely, I've seen a man develop cancer after smoking three years. The one was very resistant to it. The other, one, the other was extremely susceptible. Uh, there are the extremes, of course, but most of us are in the, in the median range. It takes 20 to 25 or 30 years of a pack a day or more smoking to produce cancer. Mm -hmm. So it's just a difference in the individual. Yes, it's a difference in the individual. Quite obviously, other physicians and researchers were not as convinced of the damage of smoking as were doctors Wender and Oxner. And the tobacco industry itself saw fit to defend its product against the charges of the researchers. And we will look at that in just a moment. But first, this message. Could this be you, serving each person in your family such foods as two to four cups of milk, four servings of vegetables and citrus fruit, two of meat, eggs, fish, or the like, and four or more of bread or other grain foods? You should give each person a total of 12 to 15 servings from four basic food groups every day. The U.S. Department of Agriculture recommends this type of diet or its equivalent to provide the vitamins and other nutrients you need. If you can't always serve balanced meals or your family doesn't eat them, give them one a day brand, multiple vitamins every day. Each tablet has all the vitamins a child or adult normally needs to take. Each tablet is double sealed to stay fresh. Moisture stays out. 
potency stays in. Prevent vitamin shortage that could lead to illness. Get the double sealed vitamins, one a day. In 1958, in the face of mounting criticism, the tobacco industry formed a membership corporation to promote public understanding of the industry. It was and is called the Tobacco Institute Incorporated. Among other things, the Institute publishes a paper called Tobacco and Health Research, which summarizes selected scientific studies. And completely apart from the Institute is the Tobacco Industry Research Committee, which administers a program of scientific research relating to smoking and health. Scientific director of that committee is Dr. Clarence Cook Little, who summarized the committee's views on smoking and health just prior to today's Surgeon General's report. The Tobacco Industry Research Committee will continue and will increase its support of independent research into the cause and development of various types of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and chronic respiratory disease. It recognizes the complexity of these problems and the existence of great gaps in our knowledge. It will do its best, hopefully in cooperation with all other agencies interested in similar objectives, to close these gaps and to solve the problems involved. It recognizes that smoking is one of many environmental factors which need further study in order to obtain the scientific perspective essential to accurate and comprehensive understanding of the nature and eventual control of the diseases already mentioned. Dr. Little is not alone in his contention that great gaps of knowledge remain in the correlation of smoking and lung cancer. Some researchers have said that cancer in the lung and elsewhere may be caused by a virus. Still others blame air pollution, a cause dismissed in today's report by the Surgeon General's Advisory Committee. Then there is another group of researchers who say a causal relationship is possible between smoking and lung cancer, but point to the lack of solid evidence as to why this is so. It's not surprising, therefore, that the controversy over today's report continues. Today's report on smoking and health. This special NBC News report on smoking and health will continue in just a few moments. But first, this pause for station identification. A week with the First Lady on Sunday at 3, 2 Central Time. NBC News continues now with its special report on smoking and health, based on today's release of the Surgeon General's report. Here again is NBC News correspondent Frank McGee. This morning in Washington, a special Blue Ribbon medical panel flatly announced that the smoking of cigarettes is a health hazard. It is a major cause, said an advisory committee to the United States Surgeon General, of lung cancer and contributes to other diseases as well. Many medical researchers agree with this conclusion, but some raise grave questions as to why this is so. One such man is Dr. Charles Dunlap, chairman of the Department of Pathology at Tulane University. I think it's fair to say that it's been established beyond any reasonable question that excessive smoking of cigarettes is related to cancer of the lung. And this is a big step forward. For the first time, a common form of human cancer has been definitely related to an environmental factor. Now, this step forward has not um, resolved the question. It actually has raised the question, the question of what is this relationship between smoking and lung cancer. There is a good deal of evidence to suggest that it is not a simple direct cause and effect relationship. For example, the great majority of people who smoke excessively do not develop lung cancer, and some people who have never smoked 
do develop cancer of the lung. And the disease is commoner among people who live in the city as compared to those who live in the country, even with people who have the same smoking habits. And we have no explanation of such uh, intriguing facts as that lung cancer is only half as common in Atlanta, Georgia, as it is in New Orleans, even among people who smoke comparable amounts. Our present understanding of cancer of the lung might be compared to the understanding of the cause of malaria uh, before it was discovered that a mosquito carried the parasite. It was well established before this time that people who lived near swamps and <clears throat> near flooded areas developed much more malaria than those who lived on high ground. And the incidence of malaria was decreased if people moved from swampy regions to high ground. And they named the disease malaria, or bad air, because they thought it was due to breathing bad air. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Uh, at a practical level, even though we don't know how cigarette smoking is related <coughs> to cancer of the lung, I think it would be a smart thing for anyone not to smoke. Us. Disparities in the statistical evidence linking cigarette smoking and lung cancer worry some researchers. One such man is Dr. L. H. Garland, a San Francisco radiologist and researcher with the University of California. And he commented yesterday. My own studies on well over 500 patients with primary lung cancer show that almost two thirds of the tumors in which the site of origin could be determined arise beyond the main bronchi. That is to say, they arise in parts of the lung where the concentration of inhaled cigarette smoke is much lower than in the trachea or main bronchi. Once more, I don't understand this. I do know that large numbers of non-smokers get lung cancer. I do know that the fundamental cause of lung cancer is not known. And therefore, until we have more reliable scientific information, I do not believe we should panic, and I do not believe we should unequivocally ascribe the leading cause to cigarettes. Not that I particularly approve of cigarettes, and indeed I heartily disapprove of much cigarette advertising, especially on TV. But that's another matter. I do know that as a physician, it's my responsibility to urge young people to be moderate in all things, to be moderate in the use of cholesterol, caffeine, meat, speed, and perhaps even speech. And of course, cigarettes are included in this. I hope that as a result of the coming report, that there will be an increased amount of research into what causes this dreadful disease, namely lung cancer, and therefore into methods of its prevention. But until we can produce the disease with the agent, for example, cigarette smoke, then we should not go overboard. And the public should know that for 15 years there have been thousands of experiments trying to produce lung cancer with cigarette smoke, in animals without success. Statistical or not, the case against cigarette smoking was enough to disturb a number of doctors and scientists as early as 1952. Roswell Park Memorial Institute in Buffalo, New York, one of the largest cancer research centers in the world, established a cancer cigarette committee and took the first steps in an anti-smoking direction. To find the culprits in tobacco, Roswell scientists began to assay cigarette smoke in the laboratory. During the past decade, more than 10 million standard-sized brands tested. Here, the Tar Baby, the largest automatic smoking machine in the country. Via a conveyor belt, 600 cigarettes are consumed every 10 minutes, with each puffed once a minute, two seconds per puff. Once around the drum for five puffs, and then a second circuit. It will take 400 cartons to get enough condensate or tobacco tars to run a series of tests. The cigarettes are injected into the holders by a blast of air pressure and eventually ejected in the same way into a five-gallon ashtray. The smoke collected is first refrigerated and then dissolved into solution.
The complexity of the research problem is evident. One has to investigate, apart from such obvious things as nicotine and arsenic, more than a dozen chemical bases. In addition, there are more than two dozen acids, a dozen phenols, and a whole host of other substances. But the tar is applied to the backs of mice. Lab animals, however, have never been affected by breathing in smoke. But Roswell scientists consider the evidence conclusive enough to yield a clear message to every heavy smoker. So much so, the Institute is distributing some 12,000 posters and matchbooks throughout New York State. So much so that it has removed all cigarette vending machines from its buildings. Roswell's staff of lecturers is busy almost every week. Uh, my purpose, my purpose in being here this afternoon is not to tell you not to smoke. In your present state of good health, you may feel that you have plenty of time to burn. However, you should realize that one out of every ten of you who's a heavy smoker will die from cancer of the lung. If I said to you that tonight, one out of every ten NFT buses that leave from in front of Bishop, in front of Bishop McMahon High School will be involved in a fatal collision, I wonder how willing you would be to take any of the buses home. If you're a smoker, you are also three times more likely to die from a fatal heart attack. You will have more stomach trouble, and your life expectancy is nearly 10 years shorter than a non-smoker's. For no previous generation has the question, to smoke or not to smoke, been such a serious one. Whether you smoke or not is a decision that each of you must make for yourself. I would not presume to infringe upon your right to make this decision. I would, however, recommend that each of you give careful consideration to the available information and to your reasons for smoking and be thoroughly clear in your own mind as to whether or not smoking is really worth it. In an effort to help adults who want to stop smoking, Roswell Park conducts a smoking withdrawal clinic. We're here this evening because you people have indicated that you have a desire to give up cigarette smoking. There are many reasons why you wish to give up cigarettes. Some of it is because of the facts concerning the relationship of cigarettes and health that have become aware to you. Some of you wish to give up cigarette smoking because your doctors have recommended that you give up cigarette smoking and you have found it impossible to do so without help. To date, almost 300 volunteers have participated, with twice that number still on the waiting list. Monthly classes average 60 persons who fill out questionnaires on smoking habits, undergo a brief physical exam, then are given a supply of nicotine substitute drugs and pills to control appetite. Nothing habit-forming, but it does help get smokers over the roughest period. All right, these are to control, the little green speckled pills are to control your appetite. The purple pills take two a day, one with breakfast and one with supper. This is to control your cigarette habit. And if you urgently need a cigarette, take one of the purple lozenges. At best, the drugs are a crutch. Just as important is the fact that each volunteer has made a mental commitment. And group therapy is evident when the clinic meets a week later. Let's see how much success we've had. How many people have been able to give up cigarettes completely? Can you hold up your hand? How many people have been able to give up almost completely or smoking 25% or less of what they did before? Is there anyone that is smoking as much as he was a week ago? One. <laughs> I'm sure there are a number of you who have questions or comments to make, and I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that you might have. Yes, sir. For 22 years, I smoked three packages of cigarettes a day. I have tried for many of those 22 years to give up smoking without any success, whatever. I find it astounding that as of three days after our meeting last week, I had no desire for a cigarette whatever. However, I have one interesting observation to make. I notice in page three of your weekly report, you list the word concentration. Correct. I happen to be the following, a lawyer and a teacher of law. I have discovered on occasions during the past week that, and it may happen now, that when I am addressing 
uh, a group or a person, I find that I forget where I am. <laughs> now this, this could ruin me. <laughs> this is during the past week. This yeah. is not May I ask, experience. is that due to the medication? Is it due to the withdrawal? How long will it last? This is not a new experience. We have had other people report identically the same thing, that they find that all of a sudden they, they just don't really remember what they were doing or thinking about a few moments and it does not last very long. It does not. It's <laughs> gratifying. Yes. Other questions or comments? Wait, now, is that simply because we're eating, you know, instead of smoking, or is there something about giving up the nicotine that makes us gain weight? We're not really sure. Originally, I felt that the reason people gained weight when they gave up cigarette smoking was because food tasted better or because they were using things like candy as a substitute for the cigarette. But there are a number of people that we have had in these smoking withdrawal groups who have sworn that they have gained weight even though they have not increased the amount of food that they have eaten. And we don't really have a good explanation for this. Can yeah, it just be time that that happens? I suppose it would balance out. It and does balance out, out and people who do gain weight very frequently we'll find that this will plateau after three or four weeks and then it's not difficult to lose the weight that has been gained. And the lady in the back? How long does it take for the urge to disappear? That varies. Some people, as you heard this evening, say they don't have any desire for a cigarette at all. I have talked to some people who have said that it's been three years since I smoked a cigarette and I'd still like to have one even though I know I'm not going to smoke. This gentleman. Do others experience a feeling of irritability? <laughs> How many people have been irritable? Is that because you felt you were irritable or somebody told you you were? Oh, yes, this is quite true. Almost everybody has a sensation of irritability. That was the situation even prior to today's report. And now the federal government, through this report, has put itself squarely into the controversy. Quite naturally, the tobacco industry reacted this afternoon. The spokesman for the industry was George V. Allen, president of the Tobacco Institute. While it will obviously not be possible for me to comment on, in detail on this 387-page report so soon after receiving it, a few observations are immediately pertinent. First, I'm sure that the report will receive the careful study it so obviously deserves. Secondly, further research is needed. As Surgeon General Terry said in his press conference this morning, there's a great deal we do not know uh, on this subject. He specifically rejected a suggestion that no further research was needed. In short, this report is not the final chapter. I endorse wholeheartedly and without any reservation Surgeon General Terry's call at the press conference, and not for less but for more research by the Public Health Service, the American Medical Association, and other public and private groups, uh, scientists who are seeking the scientific facts we so urgently need. Finally, the tobacco industry, which is already supporting a considerable health research program, stands ready to increase that support and also to cooperate with the government and with other groups on any projects which offer possibilities for filling the gaps in knowledge which still exist in this broad field of scientific concern. From at least one congressional source there was strong reaction. It comes from Senator Maureen Newberger, Oregon Democrat, who has written a critical book called Smokescreen. She's going to introduce new legislation. 
But Congress must make some meaningful contribution to the health of the American people to show that smoking is a critical national health program. Therefore, next week, I shall introduce uh, two bills. One of these I am calling the Cigarette Advertising and Labeling Act. And this gives the Federal Trade Commission the same power to regulate advertising and labeling as it now has in regulating drug advertising. It includes the power to enjoin the dissemination of packages and advertisements which fail to conform to advertising and labeling standards set by the Federal Trade Commission. The second bill I'm calling the Cigarette Health Hazards Act, and it provides for education and research. It um, will probably be uh, under the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. This will be based on the report that the smoking of cigarettes constitutes a grave hazard to the public health. My bill directs the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare to conduct a program of research for the purpose of, one, identifying, measuring, and evaluating the nature and the kind of substances that are found in cigarette smoke. Second, to determine the mechanism by which these substances affect human health and advancing knowledge with uh, respect to the behavioral aspects of the smoking habit. The bill also directs the secretary to conduct an educational program on the hazards on smoking. Strong evidence incriminating smoking as a cause of disease has been in the public domain for nearly 15 years. The Public Health Service has officially acknowledged the hazards incident to smoking for nearly five years. The work of the advisory committee consumed 19 months. This nation can afford to wait no longer. The time for the federal government to act is now. Mrs. Newberger raised the question of a study of the advertising practices of the tobacco industry, not only in the printed media, but in radio and television as well. This, too, has been a source of criticism in the past. Today, the National Broadcasting Company said, Cigarette commercials broadcast by NBC do not appear in programs designed specifically for children, nor do such commercials make special appeals to children. NBC will study its code of broadcast standards in relation to the Surgeon General's report to determine whether or not any of the code provisions should be changed. That code, NBC pointed out, sets standards for good taste and protects against misleading advertising claims. In a survey of the other major advertising outlets, NBC News was told by CBS, CBS is undertaking an immediate study of the Surgeon General's report and will re-examine its advertising standards in the light of the findings. Other comments by ABC. ABC will re-examine its advertising policies and standards relating to cigarettes. From time and life, no statement before Monday, if then. Curtis Publishing Company, no statement now. Look Magazine, not before Monday at the earliest. The leading New York newspapers also withheld comment on whether or not their policies would be changed in relationship to cigarette advertising. But in Washington, not all senators are backing Mrs. Newberger's proposals. One such opponent is from a tobacco-growing state. He's Senator Thruston B. Morton, Kentucky Republican, who spoke to NBC's Ray Scherer. Senator Morton, as I read this report, it's a clear indictment of smoking. What's it going to do to tobacco states such as your own Kentucky? Well, I think when the American people put this in the proper sense of proportion, it's not going to do too much. Now, tobacco means a lot to my state. It's 48% of our cash income for our farmers. It also means a tremendous amount of employment. My own hometown of Louisville, there are literally thousands of people in the tobacco industry. But this, uh, I can't quarrel with the clinical content of the report, but I do question some of the statistical background on which it's based. Uh, more people die of heart attacks in this country, and that, that comes, the medical profession tells us, from being overweight. And that comes from sugar. Now, are we gonna put the sugar business out? 
vegetarians say meat that is bad for you. Are we going to quit beef and lamb and pork? Uh, the Mormons tell us that coffee's bad. Are we going to break South America by stopping the import of coffee? I think when this thing gets in balance, uh, it won't make any real serious economic impact. Now, the Surgeon General said today that uh, he talked about remedial action. He said that all levels of government would be involved. What do you think the government role should be? Well, I think the government was right to publish this. I mean, the taxpayers paid for it. Uh, as I say, I don't question the clinical content, but I do some of the uh, statistical content, and I think it's great that NBC and others are letting those of us who question it put our position before the public. I don't think anything's going to be done in Congress, frankly. Senator Newberger wants Congress to take various action, wants warnings to be issued, packages to be labeled. Yes, my gracious colleague is going to introduce a bill, I think, uh, next week, Monday or Tuesday, and uh, I don't know exactly what the bill involves, but I will predict that it won't pass. Are you a smoker, Senator? Yes, sir. Is this report going to cause you to cut back? I only smoke about a pack or three quarters of a pack a day, and I doubt if I change my habits. In some, then, you see no large economic effect of this report? Not unless we go hysterical, and I don't think we will. After all, in England, where the consumption of tobacco is less than half per capita what it is in this country, the incidence of death from lung cancer <coughs> is twice what it is in this country. So I, I, I think the American people have got a degree of sophistication. They'll handle it. Thank you very much, Senator Morton of Kentucky. In Los Angeles, there was this comment this afternoon from the American Cancer Society through its president, Dr. Wendell Scott. We get that report by switching to Los Angeles and NBC's Roy Neal. Dr. Scott opened his news conference this way. At last, the relationship between heavy cigarette smoking and the increased incidence of lung cancer in men has been established as a fact. There can no longer be any doubt that the heavy smoking of cigarettes is a serious health hazard. It is time now to do something about it. The American Cancer Society urges the following six actions. One, acceptance by the medical profession of its full responsibility for advising the public about the hazards of cigarette smoking. Two, Increase research to find methods helpful to adults who want to quit cigarette smoking. Three, more research to find the specific cancer-causing substances or substance in cigarette smoking and to eliminate them. Four, consideration of discontinuing advertising to get young people to smoke. Five, consideration by economists, government leaders, and the tobacco industry on ways to cushion the economic impact of reduction of cigarette consumption. Six, effective dissemination of the information in this report to reduce the 100 a day death toll from cigarette smoking. Dr. Scott also pointed out that although cigarettes seem to be a major contributing factor, the real cause of cancer is still not known. The American Cancer Society will continue to support aggressive research by reputable organizations. He told newsmen the society will also place greater emphasis and advocate vigorous action to keep young people from forming the smoking habit. As for adults, they should continue to be permitted to make their own decisions now that they understand the risk. Roy Neal, NBC News, Los Angeles. And in Miami this afternoon, Dr. Edward Annis, president of the American Medical Association, went before television cameras to give his organization's views on the Surgeon General's report. The AMA has already announced a major research project in this field. Here is Dr. Annis. It is hoped that our patients, the American people, will heed the Surgeon General's report and the warnings inherent therein. It is hoped that young people will not start smoking. But human nature being as it is, many who smoke today will continue to smoke. To them, in the light of this report, we can give the advice, stop inhaling. 
To others, it might be better to switch from cigarettes to a pipe or to cigars and don't inhale. The American Medical Association and its doctors are not against smoking. We're not against tobacco. We are against disease. And for this reason, we will pursue vigorously our already established policy, wherein we hope to investigate scientifically to find out just what it is that takes place in the tissues of the lungs, in the cells, when people inhale over a period of time. How do the disease, disease get, get underway? How are they aggravated? What takes place? How does it take place? Why does it take place? If we know these answers, Perhaps then, perhaps then we will have a reasonable solution to the problem. In the meantime, all of our patients should read carefully and consider the results and the conclusions of the Surgeon General's report. To sum up, a special advisory committee to the United States Surgeon General said today that cigarette smoking constitutes a health hazard and the committee called for corrective action. The major points are these. Cigarette smoking is causally related to cancer in men. The data for women, although less extensive, point in the same direction. The causal relationship of the smoking of pipes to the development of cancer of the lip appears to be established. Cigarette smoking is a significant factor in the cause of cancer of the larynx. The committee suggests that the cancer of the esophagus and the bladder may be linked to smoking. No relationship has been established between tobacco use and stomach cancer. Cigarette smoking is the most important of the causes of chronic bronchitis. The smoking of cigarettes is associated with an increased risk of dying from pulmonary emphysema. Cigarette smoking does not appear to cause asthma. And there are many other facts, some firm, some vague in the report. It's expected the report, which can be purchased from the government printing office in Washington for $1.25, will become a bestseller. What happens now is that the Public Health Service will follow the report with some action, as yet not determined. Other government agencies may move into the field, and so may Congress. In any event, reputable doctors compiled this report, and other reputable doctors disagree with it. But one fact is clear. The smoker who uses two packs of cigarettes a day will consume 14,600 cigarettes in one year. It remains for the individual smoker to draw his own conclusions and take his own action. Frank McGee, NBC News. Good evening. Next week in this time period, see The Lieutenant, starring Gary Lockwood and co-starring Robert Vaughn. Monday night, the unpredictable Milton Berle joins the irreplaceable Mitch Miller for an uninhibited hour of melody and mirth on Sing Along with Mitch at 10, 9 Central Time and Color, here on NBC. Now stay tuned for the Joy Bishop Show, next in color on NBC. by NBC News, which is solely responsible for its content. This is Arthur Gary.